G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to Unparliamentary, our fortnightly show that gives you the scoop on what's happening in federal politics with a special guest journalist. This week that journalist is Karen Middleton, Political Editor at Guardian Australia and she's also joined by Emma, Dr Emma Shorter, Senior Researcher for the Australia Institute's Security and International Affairs Program at the Australia Institute. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. Um, I did want to begin by just acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to elders past and present. A uh, reminder that our webinars are at different times and days, so head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find upcoming webinars that you can sign up to. And this is on fortnightly and you can sign up multiple weeks in advance if you uh, enjoy hearing about what's happening in, in politics. Uh, if you are new to Zoom, you can type questions for Karen and Emma into the little Q&A box and we'll get to those in the second half of the webinar. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. Uh, and lastly, this is a live event. It is being recorded and you can find the video recording on our website at australiainstitute.org.au later today. So once again, it has been a huge fortnight in, uh, or oh, a month in politics since our, our last webinar. Domestically, Anthony Albanese has announced his future Made in Australia strategy ahead of next month's federal budget. Peter Dutton has been heavily criticised for drawing a comparison between a pro-Palestine uh, protest and the Port Arthur massacre. Yesterday, Bruce Lerman lost his defamation uh, case against Network 10. Uh, and Lisa Wilkinson. And obviously over the weekend and in the last few days, we've seen not one but two uh, horrific attacks in Sydney, an attack in a Sydney church, which police are investigating as a terrorist incident. And that obviously came uh, only a, a day or a few days after the horrifying scenes that we saw at Bondi Junction on Saturday. Internationally, uh, Iran launched a missile strike on Israeli territory in retaliation against a suspected Israeli airstrike on its embassy compound in Syria. China rolled back um, some remaining trade restric restrictions on Australian products and Trump has become the first former sitting president to face a criminal trial. Quite a bit to get through. I'm not sure we will get to everything. Um, but Karen, uh, the last couple of days in particular uh, have been very distressing. Two different uh, attacks in Sydney, a lot of people dead and injured. Um, what's the latest today? I know the Prime Minister uh, held a press conference this morning, I think, on that. Yeah, so I suppose it's important to distinguish between the two things, although I'm, I'm here in Sydney today actually visiting my new head office and, um, you know, very obviously in Sydney the feeling is overwhelming distress at both events. The incident on Saturday at West Bull Bondi Junction is being described as not terrorism-related. That was related to... Uh, the man who was shot dead by police there, um, Joel Couchy, uh, uh, the description is that he had had a mental illness. And so this is related to his uh, poor health and his uh, um, you know, instability. This new incident overnight at the Church of the Good Shepherd in, um, is, in Sydney is being seen very differently. They, the, the Prime Minister, sorry, the Director General of ASIO and the Head of the Australian Federal Police jointly had a press conference this morning. They have risen uh, up a terrorism task force and they are seeing this as religiously motivated violence. Um, there is a translation that came, it was this, this attack was um, during a live feed uh, at that church, of, the, of the sermon at that church. And the um, suggestion is that, that the language used by the alleged attacker indicated uh, anger about a uh, religious nature, uh, anger about um, criticism of the, of the um, preacher there for um, having criticised his faith, the, the allegation being that the preacher had criticised the Muslim faith in the past and he is a, a um, Christian, an orthodox Christian preacher. So... That is a different category. Um, we've had, we've seen a, a meeting of the National Security Committee. The government is taking it very seriously, all levels in the New South Wales government, federal government, uh, and the agencies all together. So this is a totally different incident in that regard to the one we saw on the weekend. 
Yeah, two horrific incidents, as you said, uh, quite different, but both terror inducing. Uh, and obviously, a, a huge number of deaths at Bondi Junction, just a, a horrific incident there on Saturday as well. Um, yeah, is it noticeable there where you're in, in Sydney, where all this has happened in just the last couple of, of days? It's it's very distressing. Well, I didn't want to extrapolate on the whole city because I'm in my office and kind of came here from the airport. So it'd be a bit like as soon as someone gets on the plane, how do you feel about being in Sydney? I won't do that. But um, certainly, you know, the colleagues here and my family members who live here in Sydney are very acutely feeling it. In fact, a member of my family was at Westfield Bombay Junction on Saturday and we were extremely worried about them and they had to hide in a, uh, in a storeroom in a shop. So, you know, I feel like there are thousands upon thousands of stories like that. The people are feeling it very acutely and deeply, um, the, both of these events. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a horrific, the result was horrific. The, the implications are horrific on a number of different fronts. So I think it's really shaken a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I did also want to move to yesterday's other really big news, and that was the outcome in the Bruce Lerman uh, defamation trial against Channel 10 and uh, Lisa Wilkinson. I know you've kind of been um, following a lot of these stories over a long period of time, but that was a pretty definitive outcome that Bruce Lerman raped Brittany Higgins yesterday. Just how significant was this uh, trial result? I think it was very significant for a number of reasons. And that judgment was it was quite an extraordinary judgment, really. I watched the delivery of um, Justice Lee's judgment or the extracts. He read extracts from his judgment. His whole judgment runs to 300 plus pages and he read uh, lengthy extracts. And it, it, he, has, he has forensically sort of unraveled this case. Um, you know, he was dealing with a defamation case and, you, you know, we, we, there are, we need to make the distinction between a civil case of defamation and a criminal proceeding. This is not a criminal proceeding. And defamation case is essentially is about reputation. Uh, Bruce Larriman brought this case. He said, you have defamed me in the original story you broadcast but, um, with an interview with Brittany Higgins where she alleged that an unnamed colleague had raped her. He said that he was identified readily by that broadcast and that it was defamatory. And so Justice Lee had to sort of delve right into the original allegations because Channel 10 and Lisa Wilkinson relied, one of the defences they relied on was truth. So that if if Justice Lee could find the allegations, the original allegations true, that that would be enough of a defence for them. And that is, in fact, what occurred. So he was quite critical of Channel 10 and Lisa Wilkinson for their handling of the story around Brittany Higgins, and he didn't find their secondary defence which is called qualified privilege, he didn't find that that supported because he said that there was evidence they didn't do enough to really vigorously test some of the allegations Brittany Higgins was raising around the suggestion of a political cover-up of the events back in 2019 when she alleged she was raped. They so didn't find that that was sustained and he was critical of them for not checking well enough, um, for you know, not going to a great enough lengths to really um, test that aspect of the allegations that were being made. But he very forensically divided everything up. So he said, even though that wasn't the case, he didn't find that, he went into the details of her rape allegations and he found that, that they were essentially true. So he he made criticisms of the credibility of Bruce Lerriman and Brittany Higgins. His criticisms of Bruce Lerriman were far more substantial. He basically said, you just couldn't believe what he said, he was a liar. Uh, in the case of Brittany Higgins, he criticised her credibility around uh, all the events that have occurred since she went public in 2021 with her allegations and this suggestion of a cover-up and that, that there were inconsistencies and she was a less than 100% reliable witness around the more contemporary recollections. But in terms of 2019, when the incident allegedly occurred and the contemporaneous conversations she had with people, the evidence of the witnesses around her, the things she said, the things they saw and understood, she was believable. And so he has essentially said that is true and that means that uh, the defence um, of Channel 10 and Lisa Wilkinson is supported and Bruce Lerman fails and he had the great line that I'm sure people have already seen that, uh, that having escaped the lion's den and, and the reference there was to the fact that Bruce Lerman was charged with rape in the ACT and faced a criminal prosecution for that, but the prosecution collapsed when there was juror misconduct and then it was never uh, resurrected because of 
there were concerns for Brittany Higgins' mental health. So he's never been convicted of any criminal offence. Mr Justice Lee said, you know, you, you, that Mr Lerman effectively having escaped the lion's den, reference to that, he then um, made the mistake of coming back, going back to get his hat. Uh, basically, you brought this on yourself and your reputation is being destroyed a, as a result. So it's an important judgment because he went into a great deal about um, effectively trauma-informed, it was a trauma-informed judgment about the behaviour of a person who had experienced a rape, what they might do and might not do, but the assumptions we make around how someone might behave um, really forensically looked at that. And also there's a message in there for media and media behaviour. So even though this was a victory for media, there were criticisms in there for media too. So lots of layers in this judgment and quite a profound judgment and full of very ordinary person language and some quite acerbic observations that make it an accessible judgment too. Yeah, and uh, very there was a lot of the public who were really interested in this and a lot of people kind of watched it um, on the live stream as well. Um, and the second kind of case where we've seen, I just was thinking of the Ben Robert Smith defamation case and what a giant, um, you know, own goal that was for him as well and, and his reputation in the, in the end. It's, uh, well, the link you can draw, I mean, obviously separate cases, but one of the links you can draw is that the respondents in both cases relied on truth as a defence. And, and so in both cases, it was almost like a de facto trial, although we, we have to be really clear that in a civil case of defamation, like both of those were, the burden of proof is lower. So if you are facing a criminal trial for rape, say, um, the prosecution has to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you did um, you did engage in rape. In a civil trial, the test is different. The bar is a bit lower. It's it's on the balance of probabilities. So there's a there's a bit more room there. So it's harder to prove someone is guilty in a criminal court on that charge than it is to to maybe find the truth in the civil court. So that's an important distinction. But yeah, similarities in the sense of a truth defence in both cases, a kind yeah. of a de facto trial, and a victory to the media respondents in both cases as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, so speaking of trials, Emma Shortis, uh, we <laughs> have seen uh, President Trump, uh, the first president of the United States to face criminal pro prosecution uh, in that country. That trial began overnight. Can you just remind us of some of the particulars and what's come out of that that first night? Yeah, sure. So this is, uh, you know, Karen was just drawing the distinction between civil and criminal trials. So the, the court cases we've seen Trump involved in um, so far in the last couple of um, months have been civil trials. So they've been quite different to the one that we're dealing with now. This is the first of four criminal cases that Donald Trump is involved in. This one is the one in the Manhattan um, district, which is around his um, payments, his alleged payments to an adult film star that he, um, that alleges had an affair, had an affair with him, um, which are being, um, he is being charged really with falsifying business records. So he used his allegedly used his lawyer, Michael Cohen, to, to pay Stormy Daniels to not go public with this story and, and therefore potentially influence an election result. And it then after the election, um, it's alleged that Trump paid Cohen back um, for the payments that he made. So that he's facing now 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in this way. Um and was in court for the first time in this case overnight. Um, and it, it was really quite something of watching the um, media coverage of it because this is the start of the, the case. So we're in the jury selection period. So Trump doesn't actually need to talk or, or anything like that. He's just kind of sitting there listening to, um, you know, quite a lot of back and forth really with a, a, a number of jurors. There were 96 jurors up um, on the first day and and watching reporters kind of, decide whether or not they should say that he fell asleep during the proceedings was was quite something you know there was some really quite detailed descriptions of his head dropping and his eyes were closed not in the usual kind of squinty way that he closes them but actually closed and then he startled himself which you know like uh, we shouldn't laugh because it is deadly serious you know this is the first time as he yeah. said that a, a president has been um, charged with with crimes but you know I think we have to kind of find moments of joy where we can. Um, but this, so this is the first uh, first day of what we think is going to be a six-week trial where Trump will be in court 
nine to five, four days a week. Um, it's not televised. So he doesn't have the usual kind of platform that he would use where he can be, you know, for the cameras performing, huffing and puffing, glaring at people, muttering. And so he doesn't have the kind of control over the um, optics that he would usually have and that he really, you know, those conditions that he kind of really thrives in. Um, so I think we can expect him to see him get much more frustrated and also just the kind of logistical burden of being in court four days a week for the next six weeks while trying to conduct a presidential campaign um, is going to be, you know, yet, I think kind of yet another pretty extraordinary thing to watch. Um, and in terms of the actual political implications, um I mean, we don't know yet how this obviously um, what the outcome will be, but all evidence suggests that it doesn't really matter what Trump does. He's still pretty popular with his base, mm. but is the idea that whatever the outcome, this will really harm him um, in the in the general election? Look, it's it's such an important question, but it's so hard to answer because as we've discussed, like this has never happened before. We just kind of don't know um, what the implications are. And I think even before we get to that, the potential for this to kind of go awry, you know, the potential for a mistrial, for example, given the kind of difficulties of jury selection are pretty high. But having said that, you know, it, it plays really well with his base. He's been really successful, I think, at um, kind of engineering this narrative of this being a kind of political show trial. He was out calling it a communist show trial um, the other day. So with the base, that works really well. But if you look at broader national polling, that suggests at least that if he were um, found guilty, you know, if he's convicted of these felonies and particularly if he goes to prison, that that would certainly affect the way that many people vote for him, that the, the polling suggests that that would be a deal breaker, not just for um, Democrats, of course, or independents, but also for a number of Republicans. So I, I don't think we can say yet that it won't affect him politically. It's the question is kind of how it all plays out, even just timing wise, you know, whether this is resolved before a general election, what the other cases do as well. So untangling that mess is quite difficult, but certainly polling suggests that an actual conviction would have an impact on him politically. And Emma, I just want to stick with the United States for a moment and talk about Julian Assange. We saw President Biden mm. um, make some comments in relation to his case um, just recently. Can you just quickly tell us uh, about that? Yeah, sure. So this was a really, like, it was such a small moment, but I think it was such an important one in this um, saga that Julian Assange has been subjected to. So it was the the fifth anniversary of his incarceration at, um, in the UK. And as Biden was kind of walking between the West Wing and the Oval Office with um, his Japanese counterpart, actually, a, a reporter from, I think, from the New York Post um, kind of shouted a, a question at, at him about whether... Um, they, he was considering or the administration would um, drop the prosecution of Julian Assange. And Biden, um, he, you know, he gets these questions shouted at him all the time and doesn't necessarily engage with them or, or answer reporters in, in these contexts. But he sort of took a moment and said, I didn't, I didn't hear you. Um, and the reporter kind of repeated the questions. And Biden said, we're considering it which doesn't seem like much, you know, it's only three words, but it was a, a really big moment. It's been characterised by some as an off-the-cuff remark, but I don't think that's what it was because he he took the time, I think, to, to think about what he was going to say. And even if it was meant to diffuse um, the question, you know, the fact is he's now said that his administration is consider considering dropping the prosecution of Assange, which he hasn't said before. You know, he's been really um, quite careful about maintaining distance between the administration and the Department of Justice um, to make sure that there's no kind of suggestion of interference given what else the Department of Justice is engaged in. But this, these kind of three words suggest that the administration is considering dropping those charges, which is is hugely significant, I think, for, for Assange and a real moment um, for the Australian government as well, I think, to, to seize. And we've seen the Prime Minister say um, that, you know, enough is enough. He said that multiple times. And we've also seen reports that the Australian government has asked the Department of Justice to come to a plea deal with Assange, which, again, is a kind of a, another significant step. So, It's by no means over, but it's certainly an opportunity, I think, for the Australian government to to really seize and um and really, you know, to, I think to demand the the respect that we deserve as an as an alliance partner to say to repeat that, you know, that enough is enough, and that Julian 
needs to come home. Um, and also that a political case like this in an election year just just is not a great idea for Biden either. Yeah. Um, Karen, it's obviously um, been a kind of a, a multi-partisan support for Julian Assange we've seen uh, through the parliament. Um, this is the kind of, I guess, biggest um, change we've seen in the prospects there. Um, and there's a kind of a lot happening with the US alliance at the moment with AUKUS and other considerations as well. Um, is there anything else you kind of like to add about Assange or some of those alliance elements that, that Emma was talking about there? Well, I think under the previous government, there was greater reluctance to be advocating publicly. And we don't know how much advocating was done privately, but under the Morrison government, they certainly did not advocate publicly for Julian Assange and for uh, any kind of concession for the United, from the United States. So the change has occurred with the change of government and the Albanese government has been more overt uh, in pressing. And I, I'm presuming that that's had an impact in relation to what what Emma was just describing. So that's an interesting shift and just shows you that, you know, individuals and parties do have an influence over these kinds of, the political dimensions of these kinds of cases as opposed to the justice legal system dimensions because the two things do intersect in a case like this. Mm. Um, and it is interesting. It's a bit hard to work out what it says about the state of the alliance because there's lots of moving parts to that. But clearly it's a complicated relationship between Australia and the United States. And, you know, there's often debate about whether it all goes one way and we're just always with our hand, hand out and not um, necessarily pushing back or, um, uh, you know, we're not an equal partner with the United States. But it is, it, it's kind of encouraging in a equal partner sense that the United States now appears, based on those comments from President Biden, to be seriously considering um, a request from the Australian government that would be, you know, it would be perhaps less, con less contentious because less well-known in the US than here, but certainly has some international attention. Whatever he does will, will be, a bit, you know, a significant decision. Mm. Um, Karen, I want to come now back to domestic politics and the kind of most recent major announcement from Anthony Albanese um, and the uh, future Made in Australia strategy. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit more of the details of that? And uh -huh. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, not a not, obviously not a huge amount, but I think it really kind kind of was a signpost from him about the kinds of things that um, we're going to be seeing in the lead up to the budget and a definite shift away from the Morrison government um, kind of approach to things. Um, what do you think is the significance of of that announcement and the fact that he maybe made to made the decision to announce it in Queensland, uh, knowing uh, that yes. he's a key state? <laughs> well, Queensland for a start is a hugely significant state for Labor federally because they don't do very well there in recent years uh, and they're on a pretty narrow margin already and they would need Western Australia to hold um, if they weren't going to make any gains in Queensland at the next election. So they're very much throwing a lot at Queensland and they want to make the point to Queenslanders but also to the country about um, the energy transition and to reassure people who work in those sort of sunset industries and fossil fuel industries and the like that that they are laying out a plan for the transition so it's not just a sort of a, a, um, a hope and rhetoric that, that there's a plan now we actually don't haven't seen the plan yet and that's that's part of the frustration and what he's done is a sort of yeah put out the goalpost and said we're going this way but we haven't seen details so the, the essence of what he's announced is that that Australia is basically going to move away from what in recent years has been tradition, which is the whole level playing field. People, It's become very unpopular to pick winners in industry, to offer government subsidies. You know, we've been busy tearing down tariff walls in, around the world and ensuring that everyone's on a level playing field. And what he was essentially saying is we're in a, we're in a brave new world now where our allies, particularly the United States, uh, and essentially because of the urgency of the transition to clean energy ostensibly and the need to move to more renewable forms of energy are now actively and unashamedly subsidising industries and innovation, development, manufacturing. 
to speed that transition up. So because other countries are doing that, we need to do it as well. And he's arguing uh, that we need to basically pick those industries that need support and offer them government support. And we don't know what kind yet. So we don't know if we're talking tax concessions, underwriting, you know, from government, uh, grants, subsidies, what, what, what exactly we're talking about. But the general message is they want to create more certainty that one of the big complaints of business for the past, I don't know, decade, two decades, where we've, nearly, where we've gone around and around on climate change and um, emissions reduction has been that there hasn't been consistency and certainty in policy. And investors need that if they if they want to are going to invest in, in clean energy and clean manufacturing and the like. So they're aiming to create that certainty, lay out a, a clear um, path that says the government is supporting this transition. It's not only supporting the new industries and the renewable industries, but it's also supporting the workers in the industries that may be anxious because their kinds of production and manufacturing has to be phased out. So it's the detail we're missing. And I think what he's done is wave the flag about this now, start the conversation, and we'll see a bit more of it in the budget and get much more of an idea about specifically what, what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, I can see we've got 460 people on the line with us. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to come very shortly to questions from the audience. So just a reminder, you can type in those questions in the Q&A box and you should also be able to upvote other people's questions and leave comments on them um, as well. Um, I think we're waiting for uh, the Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, to do a press conference today, but there is news out that uh, she is set to release a much truncated version of very overdue environmental reforms to the nation's environmental laws, the EPBC, the Environment Protection, Biodiversity and Conservation Act. Um, part of those reforms is supposed to be to help her kind of deliver on the pledge that she's made no extinctions under her watch or on Labor's watch. Um, and part of an overall kind of nature positive plan um, that's already gone through some some big changes in part thanks to Australia Institute research. But um, really, I think very disappointing to see what is supposed to be some, some big reforms here, either truncated or sections of it hived off for later because it's proven to be a bit difficult. And I think coming under some fierce criticism from um, environment groups for this decision. Um, so perhaps we can get into that at the next unparliamentary when we have some more details. But in the meantime, we know there's um, over 100 big national fossil fuel projects in the pipeline, both coal and gas uh, projects that are in the pipeline of development and for approval under the EPBC. And so that means those decisions um, you know, will now operate under those um, old laws, which is... Um, you know, doesn't really change uh, what needs to be done according to the uh, according to the science, but disappointing to see that those reforms um, won't hit the parliament as promised. Um, yeah, the, ba the basics of it are she's announced an environment, a national environment protection agency, but there's obvious, and she's saying that that provides stronger powers. But there's obviously criticism um, among the groups that are disappointed and the Greens saying that doesn't go anywhere near far enough. It's a watered down version of what we should have. She's announced a Environment Information Australia, which is supposed to give businesses easier access to environmental data and a, a sort of a speeding up of environmental approvals. Now, I haven't been, uh, full disclosure, I haven't been through the detail of any of that yet, but um, there's always the sort of headline and then there's getting into the detail and working out what they're actually going to do. And so that's something yeah. for next time, probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, I did want to kind of, I guess, cast ahead uh, quickly to the budget, Karen, and just not that we've seen a huge number of announcements um, so far in, in the lead up, but what are some of the, um, I guess, political concerns and economic ones for the, what are the difficulties for the government heading into this this federal budget? Obviously, we've seen inflation be a huge challenge and with that um, interest rates, what other kind of things are they balancing or will the Treasurer be thinking about as they put the final touches on it? So at this point in the cycle, government would normally be wanting to have a warm and fuzzy budget that makes everyone feel like they're um, going to be better off. You know, the election is due really roughly within the next year uh, and the most likely time at this point is in that first quarter of next year. So this may well be the last federal budget full-blown federal budget. We saw the last government have these sort of tweeny budgets. So, look, 
there'll, there'll be a mid-year update later in the year, which will give them another opportunity. But in terms of the big full budget, this could be the last one before the election. So normally our government would be handing things out in this kind of budget. And in this environment where we're all struggling with the cost of living, it, doubly under pressure to be offering more relief, but they don't want to offer that relief too directly in terms of, you know, cash or in kind because it, it then puts increasing in inflationary pressure on. And the last thing they want is for inflation to be heading in the wrong direction. They want it to be tapering and coming down as we head to the election, not going up. So they have to be careful about what kind of relief they offer for that reason. And secondly, and this puts them in a particularly complicated position, I think, politically in these circumstances, Labor has traditionally been criticised, you know, unfairly or fairly as a as a less good economic manager. It's a bit of a trope, you know, that the coalition is better at, at the economy and security and Labor is less good at that and it's better at health and education, welfare, that sort of thing. So they're constantly within the Labor government conscious to, to drive home the point that they are good economic managers. So we heard Jim Chalmers saying on the weekend, you know, not ruling out the possibility of another small, tiny, weeny little surplus. So they are, for political reasons, also wanting to be frugal. And those two things are obviously going to be in conflict. They want to be generous, to support the population, to find ways to support the population, acknowledge the struggle people are going through and offer more help. But at the same time, if they're too generous, they not only risk putting up inflation, they undermine their own argument that they are they can make hard decisions and they, they are good economic managers. So these things have to be worked out and the political imperatives balanced with the economic ones. It would be interesting to see if they reckon they find a sweet spot or which way they choose to go mm. in, in that political decision making. Uh, I will get, I can see a lot of questions there uh, from the audience, but Emma, briefly, I did want to come to you again. We have obviously seen some very concerning developments in the Middle East. We've seen uh, Iran strike uh, Israel and the United States government kind of warn Israel, Israel um, that it won't back them in any kind of um, response. And obviously Iran's um a uh, decision to attack Israel is obviously in response to um, a suspected Israeli bombing of its consulate in Syria um, and overall huge concerns that this is really going to escalate conflict, mm. um, obviously. Uh, what are some of the key things that people should know both about that US response and what that might mean in terms of escalation or de-escalation? Sure. So, so the US response has been... Um, fairly clear. Uh, I think um, initially, you know, the, the US is, of course, deeply involved in the defence of Israel. And in light of this attack by Iran, Biden administration has returned to that rhetoric of, of ironclad support for Israel's defence. And, and the US did play a, a, quite a significant role in actually shooting down um, a number of those, I think, 300 plus drones and, and missiles that Iran um sent towards Israel. So there's been a, a kind of return to that rhetoric that we saw in the the initial days after the October 7 attack, but with, a, with I think, an important call for that. So, so all of that rhetoric about ironclad support has been around the defence of Israel, whereas the US has been very clear that it will not participate in any offensive action that Israel decides to take if, if it should decide to take it against Iran. So that's an attempt, again, I think, by the Biden administration to to de-escalate because the concern has always been that this conflict would spill out regionally um, and there's always been efforts by the United States and a big focus by the United States on really, I guess, mitigating that as best they can because, of course, it has already spilled out regionally and, and it did from the start. Um, and I think it's also really important to highlight that this kind of, I think, adds to that growing sense that's been developing over the last six months in particular around, you know, what the United States and the, and the West would call the international rules-based order. Because, of course, this, as you said, this this retaliation by Iran, and it is a violent retaliation, and I don't think, you know, we absolutely shouldn't minimise that, it happened in the context of that airstrike against an Iranian consulate, which has is often kind of put down right down the bottom of media reports or not mentioned at all by leaders like Biden, um, or even leaders in Australia, but it is quite extraordinary and, and breaks all the conventions of international law um, and the established rules-based order to attack 
a consulate and to attack diplomatic staff, diplomatic space and diplomatic staff. The Vienna Convention is kind of one of the foundational principles of international diplomacy. And, and when that begins to crumble, you know, the, the whole system, I suppose, um, is in question. And so that context is incredibly important, um, as is, I think, the nature of the Iranian response, which was absolutely violent and is to be condemned and and certainly contributes I think to a, a terrible sense of insecurity within Israel this is the first time that Iran has attacked Israeli soil and entered in, um, Israeli airspace in that sense so in an already deeply insecure environment that's really adding I think um to that kind of se sense of of insecurity and of Israel being under siege. But it, I think it's important to say as well that this attack was very carefully calibrated by Iran. So these drones, well, first of all, there was two weeks between the attack on the consulate and this particular attack where Iran provided significant warning that they were going to do something. And then these, the drones that they used that they launched from Iran take several hours to reach Israel and Israeli um, airspace. And so there was a significant amount of time in which Israel could respond and its allies of course, including the United States could could respond. And that's why all of these were were shot down and there was minimal damage. So I think the Iranian regime has calibrated this response in order to send a message domestically, which it has to do. You know, we're dealing with an autocratic regime that wants to ensure its own security and telegraph a message of strength to its own population, which it's actively repressing, while simultaneously seeking not to escalate this further. So after the attack and after they were all shot down, the regime said they considered this matter concluded. And I think so left the door open for this for us to go back, I suppose, to a status quo of kind of proxy wars. Whether the Israelis will will do that, I think is another question. We don't know what the response will be. There have been a few meetings of the Israeli war cabinet. They have said they will respond, but we don't know what the nature of that will be and whether, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu will heed Biden's warning to not to not go on the offensive with Iran. We know they have a a very fraught um, relationship. I think to put it mildly. So really, we'll just have to wait and see. And I, I think um, really hope that diplomacy wins out and that this conflict doesn't escalate further, you know, into the region. Karen, I, I hope I'm not putting you on on the spot a little bit, but maybe you know I um spoke a lot about the Biden administration's response mm. to developments in in the Middle East. Um, if you're able to take us through a little bit the the Australian government's response and what you make of um, the Prime Minister's response in particular. Yeah, the Prime Minister was very cautious about um, being too interventionist uh, in relation to responding to Iran. He was very firm on um, against the Iranian attacks but also stepping cautiously because, of course, the United States, you know, the initial response, as I understand it, from the Biden administration was to client, uh, to suggest that um, the Iranian response, while being condemned, that amounted to uh, a reply to the attacks mm. in Syria and that this should not then escalate to another Israeli response. Now, you spoke before about um, the uncertainty around that and the messages coming out of Israel which is suggesting there may well be some kind of further response and that's clearly been the United States um, you know the messaging from there has been they don't want that and there's great deal of concern about this being a hair trigger situation and I think at this point the Australian government you know is a big player in this but is standing back on, and watching and trying to assess the implications but it's really it's one for larger allies in the first instance with a closer connection to the region. Just checking that you guys can hear me. We can. We can. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Not a bad effort to be doing these since the pandemic broke out. And I think that's the first uh, first super technical challenge we've had. So apologies that's on your first webinar with us, Karen. Indeed, so, no problem. Um, so I will come to now questions um, from the audience. There's quite a few here um, and quite a number of people really interested interested in that uh, Bruce Lerman defamation uh, decision and some of the other implications. Mm -hmm. So um, one person, Maureen Martin, asking uh, if it's expected to have any impact on the Linda Reynolds defamation case against Brittany Higgins. Has there been any um, thoughts on that? So we do have to be careful because obviously there are other legal proceedings in train, so we need to look at these things all separately and I don't want to speculate about what the findings might be in relation to that. There's... Linda Reynolds uh, has a defamation case against Brittany Higgins in Western Australia. That's a civil case, like we were talking about before. It's a reputational damage case, uh, and that that will 
be tested um, uh, under civil law. And in Queensland, uh, Bruce Lerman is facing a completely unrelated and separate criminal charge. Um, so there are other proceedings. And the court, for that reason, I think it's we just have to be very careful about trying to spe speculate and extrapolate um, beyond what we've done about this one judgment. So I'll probably just stick to the implications more broadly rather than, of the judgment um, yeah, like I did before about me messages from media and the like without yeah, trying to well, project I've, onto other cases. I've got a couple of other questions then that I think do go to some of that more specifically. So um, I've got uh, Mel Smith asking about um, as a female professional who deals in, you know, who is in the media, um, what some of the implications are for I guess this case and and the whole the whole saga for um, combating sexism that leads to male violence with more responsible journalism. So getting to that idea of the lessons for the media, um, and the other one interested in that you know that the judgment being a bit of a beacon of hope in a pretty bleak environment for women. This is from Jane Carslake, and kind of I guess asking about. I think that's getting to that idea of this was a very trauma informed um, judgment. Yeah, uh, both of those questions, I think, in some ways are in terms of potential broader implications. We've already seen, well, we saw when those first uh, Brittany Higgins allegations were first made public in 2021, the movement that grew it, it, just in response to the airing of those allegations, um, initially around behaviours in Parliament House and issues around attitudes to women, and then just more broadly, and we saw public rallies and the like. So it really um, just the allegations themselves, which haven't then been tested at all, raised this uh, public, it was a moment of public reckoning around all of these issues. As a result of that, we've also seen the Jenkins inquiry into the standards, behavioural standards in the parliamentary workplaces. There are criticisms, and I think they're fair criticisms, that the, that the parliament itself has been a bit slow in implementing those findings. So in some ways, there is a connection between this judgment and that process in the sense that they are all, you know, they stemmed out of the same public allegations. So I think that it, there'll be public pressure even more now to, for the politicians to get on with it and really implement the full extent of um, Kate Jenkins' findings about that bu that building broadly. So there's that. Um, and I think, I do think it will be a judgment that we pour over in relation to just the way the legal system engages with people making allegations of sexual assault. You know, uh, it's, I sat in the criminal trial, which was a separate proceeding, and that didn't proceed. But, you know, you are reminded of the difficulty of making an allegation of rape and the um, the rigorous interrogation that rightly involves uh, both of, of well, of, of the of the person making the claim in a criminal trial and then subsequently in the civil trial of defamation, all parties. Um, and so it was, I think it was a particularly thoughtful judgment from Justice Lee looking at really trying to unpack, well, how do, how is a, a rape victim likely to behave? What assumptions do we make? What presumptions do we make? And I hope that that kind of really forensic but also compassionate analysis uh, can be the basis of re-examining the legal system and well, how do we engage with people making allegations of sexual assault? Is the system... Uh, um, treating those fairly? Is it coming to dealing with those issues with baggage? Um, so hopefully I think it'll be an opportunity to do that because, I mean, he was able to both kind of in a vivid way in terms of his language and his accessible language, but also in a dispassionate way in terms of being independent of the whole thing of what, and he called the whole the whole thing we've seen in the last few years an omni shambles and like it, it's just got more and more complicated. He was able to really pull this apart and say, well, I'm making some criticisms of Brittany Higgins's credibility in this particular context about some of the allegations around a cover up, but I am, I am, believing her in relation to the original allegations of rape and of the way she behaved. And he, in some ways he forgave, as understandable, some of her confusions and uh, contradictory evidence later on because he believed that that was a result of trauma. So I do think there are really important nuggets of stuff in there for the broader legal system and indeed, to the point about reporting, for the media on these kinds of cases 
and the implications for the person you're making an allegation about as well as the person making the allegation. Um, so it, in those cases, but also just more broadly, that we can't just go through the motions of saying we've given someone the opportunity to comment on the story we're about to write to, about them. We actually have to make a genuine attempt to investigate if what we're being told is true and really rigorously put to them um, these allegations, give them an opportunity to reply, not just with, you know, how many minutes, hours, days before you're going to air um, and, and consider the responses that you get. So I do think there are important series of messages mm. in there um, with implications really quite broadly. Yeah. Um, Emma, is there anything else you would like to add to that? Look, I, I mean, I think it's just obviously, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't focus so much on um, Australian politics or gender, but the, the thing that strikes me is the the really interesting parallels between this case in Australia and the civil trial, civil defamation trial um, that E. Jean Carroll brought against um, Donald Trump for, for defaming her. And, and in a kind of quite similar circumstances, a civil case found that Donald Trump, Donald Trump was liable for sexual assault. So, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the the lessons are there, but I think that that question of trauma-informed judgments and an approach that is not um, criminal in nature and doesn't ca- come with that kind of extreme interrogation of um, victims who are making allegations, you know, there's something to be said, I think, about the effectiveness of a, of a, sim- a civil system, both here and in the United States, as compared to a a criminal trial. Mm. Uh, Can I just add one more thing that I think is really important about this judgment is it it leans not only on the letter of the law and on forensic kind of dispassionate examination, it leans on common sense as well. And some of the, you know, frustration of watching these various proceedings in various forums, be they the criminal proceedings or different, you know, the soften off inquiry or, uh, or this defamation trial that were all around the original allegations you know as a as a person who works in parliament house it's frustrated me that there were some things about working in there in the building and what's normal and what's not normal practice that were never really interrogated and um and and justice lee has kind of cut through that and and said you know i don't believe bruce lerriman i don't believe the excuses he made about going into parliament. By the way, he gave several different excuses and none of them are believable. You know, you wouldn't go to Parliament House at two o'clock in the morning to work on a question time brief on a paper brief, which very handily you can't trace in any electronic system, uh, 10 days before the question time is going to be held. It's just not logical. So there's a there's a theme of kind of raw common sense to this judgment. Um, regardless of the finding that he made, the stepping through and, and the relying on well. Is that normal behaviour in this circumstance for an ordinary person in this circumstance? And I just think that is also, that really sets it apart as a fascinating judgment. Mm. Um, I've got a couple of questions that I feel like are linked by gender, but going back to the the attacks um, over the, the last couple of days in Sydney and uh, not that any of us are, I think, are terrorism experts on the panel, but Jennifer Manson asking about how we define terrorism and kind of making the point that uh, even though it appears um, the perpetrator in Bondi was targeting women, that gets described as not a terror incident. And, you know, um, obviously we've got indications that it was one when it came to the religious extremism motivation um, as it appears in the stabbing last night. Um Karen, I guess you've um, been in in politics for a long time now, and you've seen, particularly post September 11, you know the the securitization and and a, a big change in kind of how we deal with terrorism. But how much do we grapple with that? What you know that definition, the fundamental. Well, I think that's a very interesting point. And I had the same thought this morning when I was hearing the debate and various people's comments about this incident overnight because. Um, both incident in in the case of both incidents, people were terrorized. Um, and so it's it's a sort of a pedantic definitional point, isn't it? But I think in the government, and maybe Anna can contribute to this, she may know better than me, but think she may not, not. But, you know, the, the agencies, the security agencies and government tend to kind of have a definition of terrorism in this context as being religiously motivated or ideologically motivated. Interestingly, when I heard them speaking this morning, they were also talking about um, the element of publicity around it because this was an event that was being live streamed and they seem to be suggesting and bearing in mind there's an investigation underway and we don't want to get ahead of that 
because you can make trouble for the people trying to get to the truth. Um, there was an implication that the fact that this uh, alleged perpetrator had chosen an opportunity when an event was being live streamed seemed to contribute somehow to the definition they were working on of a terrorist offence. So I don't have a hard and fast government definition sitting in front of me, but those are the sort of elements that they tended to work on, particularly religious motivation or ideological motivation or political dimension to it, as opposed to an individual um, focus, fascination, whatever. But I take the point that, and we still, there has been speculation around the nature of the attack on the weekend at Westfield Bondi Junction and the fact that all the, vi the victims, aside from the poor security guard, were female and the poor security guard was obviously trying to disarm the offender. So he was, in that sense, putting himself offensively in the path of the offender and may not have been a victim of choice ha had he not done that. Um, you know, there's naturally debate around that, but we don't, we, we haven't got enough information yet to say definitively why that might have happened. And I understand people saying, well, doesn't that qualify as a form of terrorism against women? And I think, you know, it's it's something we'll debate, but at the government level and at the security agency level, they are operating for the purposes of distinguishing between the two on this definition around ideology and religion. Mm. Uh, Emma, anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, sure. I, like, I think Karen's right that that the the kind of um, ideological or religious motivation is is what kind of shapes that definition and how we define terrorism. Not so much that it only I shouldn't say only that it inflicts terror on the victims because of course it does, but it's that kind of religious and ideological definition which is really malleable and and can change quite quickly and and I think is. Um, interesting often for what it includes in as much as what it excludes. Um, and there's there's a significant amount of evidence and discussion, for example, around right-wing extremism and the fact that Australian intelligence organisations and, and particularly American ones as well don't necessarily consider right-wing extremism in that category of terrorism, despite particularly in the United States a significant increase in political violence and and arguably under that kind of definition, terrorism committed by right-wing extremists, you know, you're doing things like quite literally kidnapping a, a governor of Michigan, for example, you know, that that is, I think, under most definitions, um, a terrorist act, albeit committed by right-wing ideologues. Um, and I think the other thing I, I would say, and there's, there's a, a significant body of work on this around, you know, whether it is an effective choice to define crimes like this as terrorism as opposed to criminal acts and whether elevating crimes like this to the status of terrorism in fact ends up giving more attention um, and more focus to the people who are committing these crimes than would treating it as a, a criminal act. So, obviously, you know, I'm not an expert in these particular definitions, but I think they are really important um, conversations to have, you know, that how how do we define terrorism? What makes it different from a regular criminal act, a regular a, a, cr a criminal act, and what what does our response then end up doing? Um, how does it elevate or not the crimes that are being committed in the eyes of of people who are watching? So these are, are really difficult and painful conversations, but they're really important ones to have. And I reckon, yeah. Ebony, too, when it gets where it gets really complicated, if we if we set these two specific examples of slides, I don't want to talk about them specifically, but if we set the hypothetical scenario mm -hmm. where a person attacks a particular cohort of people, be that based on their gender, their religious belief, their whatever, um, it, it gets down to what was their motivation. If they were motivated by some personal life experience that has made them hate a particular cohort of people, then in the context that we're talking about, about official definitions, I think that is being seen as slightly different to if they are, if, if, if that motivation comes from um, some ideological teaching, religious belief, a, a distortion of it. or Identifying with a bigger movement, essentially. Bigger movement, that's right. So I think that's where they're drawing the line in, in, the, in, in trying to dissect that, but I, I'm not wanting to cast any aspersions or make pronouncements on the two events themselves, but I think that's the distinction that the government and agencies are, are drawing in, in cases when they're trying to work out whether they call it one thing or another. Yeah. Um, one last question here from John Preston, who says the future Made in Australia bill sounds like quite a big pre-election announcement to me. Karen, what do you think of the chances Albanese will go to the polls earlier than the anticipated first quarter of next year? 
oh, you know what? We spend our lives wringing our hands trying to work this out, which is a completely pointless exercise, really. Um, there are competing priorities, aren't there, and competing tensions. No Prime Minister ever wants to give up that job, stressful though it is, especially in times like we're going through, earlier than they have to, um, or, or even risk. I shouldn't assume that anyone's going to win or lose, but risk risk that by going to the polls earlier. We've certainly seen surprise results where governments that thought they were safe got turfed out in the past. So you don't want to go too early and not achieve re-election. At the same time, you want to go when you can maximise your um, chances of victory. And oftentimes, you know, it's, that's hard to judge. And you might want to sort of leave it late, but not too late, because you box yourself in, you've got nowhere else to go. You're going to have to go you know, at the end of the term, like it or not, even if things aren't going so well. So it's a hard decision to make and where, you know, the government has to, the Prime Minister, let's face it, it'll be the Prime Minister, has to make that decision where all things are. But generally speaking, governments will opt to go later rather than earlier. Yeah. Um, I want to And think- there's a seasonal consideration too and other things like they don't want to go when, we, when the footy finals are on. They don't <laughs> want to go when it's freezing cold because everyone's cranky in the winter. They don't want to go when they're on holidays or over Christmas because don't bother me. I don't want to talk about politics. But those narrow things, that's why we end up with kind of October, November and March. March. Often. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're jammed by our cultural and seasonal obligations yeah. and our mood. Um, I do want to thank John Preston for being our token male. I'm not sure if it's our three woman panel or some of the subjects that we were discussing today, but overwhelmingly the questions have been from women today, which makes a really nice change. Thank you everyone who has submitted a question today. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to all of them, but uh, I've really appreciated uh, the conversation that we've had. I feel like we've covered quite a few topics. Thank you very much, Karen Middleton and Emma Shortis. Much appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us online. We had about, I think, 460 people live. And don't forget, you can uh, subscribe to the Australia Institute on YouTube and to our podcast, Follow the Money and Dollars and Cents, wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Uh, we'll be back with Unparliamentary a fortnight from now with Karen's colleague, Paul Carp. He'll be joining us uh, in two weeks' time. And don't forget to check out all our upcoming events on our website, australiainstitute.org.au. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon, Karen. Bye, Emma. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified when we publish a new one. See you next time.